Well, praise the Lord. And yes, it is another Thursday evening. And I know you're all sitting there going, and it's the night of the Lord's round table, the best day of the week. I know I say it every week, but I really feel that way. I love the Lord's round table because it is the Lord's round table. And I'd like to welcome all those that are uh, calling in through the Lord's round table and those that are listening through the radio waves. Uh, Whatever part of the world that you're in, whatever time, day, night, lunchtime, breakfast, whatever it might be, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. And uh, my name is Steve. For those that don't know me, uh, I'm the doorman of the Lord's Round Table, and I take that with just so much delight. I'm going to get a name tag that I'm going to start wearing on Thursday evenings that says Steve the Doorman. But I'm excited about tonight and our brother, uh, Dwayne Fleurl, that is with us. He's no stranger. Some of you, as I have talked to you throughout the week, uh, you remember him being on before. And uh, we weren't disappointed before, and I know we're not going to be disappointed this evening as well because he is truly a man of God. He has got that anointing of God. He's got ears to hear as the Holy Spirit speaks to him. He doesn't speak of himself, of what his words, but he speaks the words that the Lord has laid on his heart. And you can't go wrong with that, brother. And I'm excited, and uh, I'm just going to turn it over to you now. And, Dwayne, we're just all excited to have you here, and we're all going to sit back and just glean off of what you have. Hey, Steve, thank you so much first for your friendship, for your heart, and for this opportunity. It is always a delight uh, to be with you. It's always a delight to just talk about the Lord. I'm glad I called in a little bit earlier so we could have a chat, and I thought we were just going to go off to glory. Right from our conversation, my brother, uh, you always excite me and, and uh, bless me. And uh, so, thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, just to be with you and and all of those uh, across the nation, around the world that are a part of this. So, uh, man, what a what a blessing! And, and just to see what God's doing right here in Ohio, to hear what He's doing across the land, always blesses me. Uh, I'll tell you, as I was preparing uh, for this evening, uh, what a crazy world we're in, um, and craziness seems to be the specialty of the day, but uh, uh, the Lord always prepares us ahead of time for what it is he's doing. Uh, he never, never gets caught off guard, uh, and as we walk with him, we don't either. We have some uh, things that kind of like a punch in the gut sometimes, but uh, we just look back to him, keep our eyes focused on him, and uh, he makes our ways clear. Uh, but back in January, my wife and I uh, went with some friends for my first trip ever to Israel. Uh, had never been there before. I've, I've preached it for years, and um, had been able to uh, uh, see pictures of, of the land of promise, but have never, ever uh, visited till this year. And it's interesting, the time that we went was just prior to um, the whole COVID outbreak and the clamping down on everyone. So we were one of the uh, last groups to, um, within weeks of being able to get in to that land. And if you've never been there, uh, man, what a rich experience that was. And as you can imagine, going to the places where Jesus walked in Nazareth, seeing the Old Testament come alive on so many settings. But uh, Steve, for me, there was something that happened as we walked into Caesarea Philippi. And um, Caesarea Philippi gripped me the moment we walked into that city the remains of that city. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight because I do think it really uh, comes close to home where each of us live now. Um, it, uh, it lays in ruins, uh, but some of the things that are there are very familiar to us. One of the uh, flow, flows of water that comes out of Mount Hermon uh, is the beginning of the Jordan River, um, and it flows all the way down and, uh, through Israel and down to the Dead Sea and just um, so much life flourishes because of what the Jordan River brings to that region. But um, 
as we entered Caesarea Philippi, and, and, and if you'll think with me of what that must have looked like uh, in its day. Now, when we were there, it was ruins and, and some stones that were so obvious from the time of Jesus. But you almost pictured if you've been to a state fair or a county fair and you hear all the noises, the clatters, the family uh, carrying on, uh, laughter taking place, and, uh, activities, and no doubt the smell of the animals, the hay, uh, all the things that come along with that. They were just so apparent uh, as you would enter Caesarea Philippi and the district of uh, Philip. And Philip was good friends uh, with uh, Alexander, uh, with uh, Caesar. He uh, uh, found himself uh, benefiting Caesar's rule because Caesar had blessed him with a couple of uh, providence to see, oversee. Caesarea Philippi was one of those. And so it had become a very important point uh, in the life of people that lived in northern Israel, just west of uh, Damascus. And um, the, the reason Jesus and his disciples found themselves going there, uh, you have to go back through the Gospels and see that for about a little over two years, Jesus, uh, with his disciples, had ministered amongst the people. Uh, they had watched Jesus teach. They had watched Jesus feed the crowds. They had watched Jesus uh, heal. They had watched Jesus uh, raise the dead. They had witnessed the work of Jesus, and so had the disciples. But then after a little over two years of his earthly ministry, Jesus pulls his disciples aside, and they go up to what's the Golan Heights up in northern Israel. And it says in the scripture that he spent what we would consider about six months of intense Bible study. Now, I don't know about you, but can you imagine being able to be with Jesus all day and all night as Jesus would just pour out these incredible truths of who he was, what he had come to do, uh, and he had pulled away from the crowd to intentionally pour into the lives of his disciples. And after about six months, he knew the cross was before him and that Jerusalem was before him. So he instructed his disciples and said, it's time to go. So think about this for a moment. You've spent over two years watching. You've spent over six months listening intently to him. And now he says, let's go. And so as they're making their way back to Jerusalem from being up in the Golan Heights, probably about 100 to 120 miles. Um, when you're out on the road and you're driving and you look at that sign, it says 120 miles to the next city. you got wheels under you and an engine in front of you that's uh, going to pull you to that location pretty quick. But for Jesus and his disciples, it was primarily on foot. And as they're making their way back, they come to this town I mentioned before, Caesarea Philippi. And some incredible things happened there, Steve, in Caesarea Philippi, with everything going on around them. Uh, in Matthew chapter 16, if, if you have a Bible and, and want to read about this story, just turn over to Matthew chapter 16. And, and here's what it says beginning in verse 13. And when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples this question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they begin to say, some say John the Baptist, other Elijah, others say Jeremiah, and, and some even say you're one of the prophets. And so, again, in that setting with all the activities, festivities, families, noise, laughter, sounds of the animals, and this city of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus said, so who do these people think that I am in the midst of everything going on around here? Now, you know as well as I do, Jesus doesn't pull the rabbit out of his hat. Jesus has a clear purpose when he speaks. And, and when I walked into Caesarea Philippi to remain, this passage jumped all over me. Because it was in that setting where in verse 15, and he said to them, but whom do you say that I am? Not who do they say I am, 
Now, guys, it's time to, to man up. It's time to step up and determine not what has somebody else done, not what do other people say. I'm asking you, where do you stand in relationship with understanding me right now? Simon Peter, and I love Simon Peter, right? That, you know, so many people do. Simon Peter is always one of the first ones to speak up. Uh, even when he says things wrong, we end up coming away with better understanding of who Jesus is than had he never spoken at all. And I say that for folks that may be listening right now to think, man, every time I open my mouth, my foot hits right there. Uh, but in this particular account, Simon Peter, when he speaks, we come away with more understanding and clarity of biblical truth. And Simon Peter said, you are the Christ the son of the living God. See, that's personal. And as I've gone through this passage time and time again, the confession of Simon Peter is so personal. It's not a generalization. It's not the mood swing politically or economically or uh, of intelligence. It is a very personal, direct question. Who do you say that I am? Because that really does make a difference. And Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. Now, it's so easy for us to say, and he needs me. No, he doesn't need me. Well, I really kind of make things move around here. No, I don't make things move around here. Simon Peter declares, it's you, Lord. You're the beginning and the end. You are the son of God. That's personal. And Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So when we're talking about this message of the gospel, especially today, especially today, it's got to be personal, but it's also got to be prophetic. We cannot go by what we think, feel, or choose. There must be a work, and I'll use the term in our spirit. Where the Lord, is, as Paul writes over in Ephesians, and says he has quickened us in our spirit. And so it's in our spirit that Christ does this incredible work. And that is a prophetic word that is all based on who Jesus Christ is as he's revealed. Now think of it this way. Tonight you may be listening to me talk and go away and, and not think about me or what I've said anymore. But when the Spirit speaks to our spirit, we've been made alive into Him. It's not something that lays dormant. It's something that becomes very much alive. And then it is not revealed through what I can think, do, or choose. It goes much deeper than that to the place where the Spirit of the living God shows us that. So with that said, if you do get anything from this evening, it's not because I said it in some incredible, awesome way. It's because the Spirit of the living God has quickened it in your spirit in order that you hear it and not only receive it, but listen, you and I are transformed because of it. We cannot stay the same any longer. The Father in heaven is the one who's given it. And he goes on to say in verse 18, and I tell you, you're Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. See, that's powerful. So you've got a message that's personal, you've got a message that's prophetic, but you've got a message that's powerful. And again, I want to go back to as I stood there in front of Mount Hermon. You see, Mount Hermon, uh, the, the city of uh, Caesarea Philippi, butts up against the side of Mount Hermon. And Jesus doesn't just pull these words out of thin air and hope you can paint some kind of a picture. While the disciples are standing there, they are literally looking at Mount Hermon. Now, if you'll picture it with me, if you'll look ahead, to your left is the temple of Alexander. Philip, in order to honor Alexander for giving him the providence and to show his appreciation, he built a temple to Alexander. So you've got the political theme right there. You want to talk politics? You go into that place and you can worship and sacrifice and get on the right side with all the political jargon that you want because 
he's built a temple to Alexander. I know people today, maybe you're one of you are in that boat where it's all about the politics. It's all about being able to sort those things out. Then to the other side, to the right side from the temple of Alexander was the temple, the place where they danced with goats. And it was the most sensual, perverted arena that anyone could imagine. And the, the whole idea of those that were there in Caesarea is, hey, we're going to die. What difference does it make? And so this area region had been around since the Bronze Age. So they had had a long history of various kinds of gods. And the sensual gods seemed to satisfy so many that they became very dark in their activities with each other because they felt like there's no purpose beyond this world. And so maybe if you got the Temple of Alexander, you also had this temple of sensuality. Man, how many people are caught up with sensuality to where it's something they chase after? Then once they get there, it leaves their soul empty and starved and dark and frustrated. And, and that's what was going on. And then right in the middle of that was the temple to Pan. Now, maybe uh, if you ever go back and look at some things, you'll see pictures that Pan, the god Pan, was half man and half goat. And he was one that did and lived totally by feeling, totally by whatever satisfied his flesh. So you've got these three markers. You've got the political, you've got the sensual, and you've got religion. All right there at the base of Mount Hermon. Three strong things that I think still eat the lunch of many people yet today. And right bet between the Temple of Alexander and the Temple to Pan, there was this pool with water upon a pool of water was that they had never been able to find the bottom of that, of that water well. And so many people in that setting believe that was the gate to hell. They believe that they could not get to the bottom of it, therefore it went to the presence of the dark. Now think about this for a minute. You've got these three examples set up there, and they would take their sacrifice Sometimes human sacrifice, sometimes animal sacrifice. And they would go to the gate of hell or of Hades, and they would take their offering to show their true diligence and allegiance to the god Pan. And they would throw it into this bottomless pit. If that offering disappeared, if that offering disappeared, the gods had accepted their offering. But if that offering floated back to the surface again, it meant that the gods had rejected, regurgitated that offering. That offering wasn't good enough. And they'd have to go back and go through the whole ceremonial practice again to try to appease the anger of the gods. Stephen, that setting, that's where Jesus stood with his disciples, looked at these three structures built into the base of Mount Hermon, and he said, this is my charge to you. I want you to tell no one who I am. But in verse 18, he said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not reject my offering. Now go on down, and it says, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That refers back to Isaiah chapter 22, where the high priest was given the keys. And he literally could open the temple or close and lock the temple, keep people in or keep people out. And Jesus says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he charged his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. And in verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes. And he would be killed, and on the third day he would be raised again. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Lord, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. 
But he turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on things of God, but rather you're thinking on the things of man. And so, Steve, when I stood there at Caesarea Philippi, and I looked at these three structures that represent the same thing, I meet people every day that are dealing with those same issues, looking to those same sources to be their answer. Look how divided we are as a people today. It's because we're trying to say if you're not in this temple, you're, you're not going to be on the right side. If you're in that temple, you're on the right and, and we get all of these things that divide us, and we keep trying to present offerings that we think maybe this will be the right thing. Uh, I'll sacrifice this or I'll cut this out of my life. And the, the offering is regurgitated because it never can do for us what we really need for it to do. And Jesus says, I want to tell you that the offering I'm going to bring when we get to Jerusalem, the gates of hell will not be able to regurgitate what I'm going to do for the souls of people that I died for. And see, that's what Jesus did for me, for you, and for everyone else that's listening. Jesus became an offering that could not be rejected. And it says, upon this rock. Now, again, these structures were built right into the rock, the base of Mount Hermon. Now, now picture this for a moment. These structures are built in a rock, and even while I stood there, they have crumbled. There were remnants of what they once, once were. Jesus said, I will build my church, his church, upon the rock, and it will stand. Now, out of Mount Hermon also, as I already said, uh, was the beginning of the Jordan River. The Jordan River started and flowed out of that mountain, and it flowed down, and as it flowed, it brought life and rich vegetation. We went down to one of the areas later in our trip there, and looked at some of the areas where it's possible, um, they don't know for sure, but areas that were possible where Jesus was baptized, where many others were baptized as they identified themselves in faith and by faith in him. And life comes from the water. Life comes from the living water, from the living water. Jesus Christ, he's the word, he's the bread, he's life. And that continues to multiply over and over again. And what they could have so easily seen in Caesarea Philippi, the crowds missed because they weren't looking to the right person. And Jesus is looking at his disciples, and he said, guys, who do these people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And it's almost like he says without it being recorded in Scripture, guys, if you can't determine that here right now, you're not going to make it when you get to Jerusalem. You're not going to make it when things get really tough because we're walking through these crowds and there'll be people that don't even know we're here. But when we get to Jerusalem, we're going to be called out and we're going to have to declare our faith and our personal trust and confidence in Jesus being the Lord, the Son of the living God. And so um, I'd, I'd, I'd ask us to think about a couple of questions. Um, And I thought about these as I was getting ready for tonight, too. If Jesus were to come to me, to you, right now tonight, and ask you, who do you say that he is? What would you say? Not the, all the, the soft, fluffy stuff. I, I mean, today, uh, we got to cut bait and fish. We, we got to... We got to determine to put it in the right gear to get down the road. We've got to determine that what we're doing has purpose. That the one we're trusting in truly makes a difference. And so, if Jesus says, "Are you willing to put it all on the line for Him tonight?" Where, where are you in that? Um, think of it this way: a, a guy once gave everybody a piece of paper, and he he wrote zero to ten and had a mark in between each of the numbers. And he said, so if you go from zero to ten, zero being totally distant, cold, not related to Christ at all, not even caring about the things of Christ, to ten where you're on fire, sold out, totally committed to him, 
where would you see yourself on that scale right now? And so different people in the crowd, some wrote three, some wrote seven, some wrote five, some wrote t- uh, ten. And he said, if you can't write ten, why not? If he's really who he says he is, why not? Why is it that you and I cannot come to a place where we say, Lord, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. And today I choose you. I also think of it this way. If you don't have something worth dying for, you really don't have anything worth living for, nor do I. But if he's worth living for, there's nothing else that will compare to the life that we have in Christ. So I'd love to be able to pull the disciples aside one at a time after he asked that question and say, hey, Peter, what what were you thinking when he said that? John, what went through your mind? Uh, James, where were you with all of that? If, if I'm back and forth with him right now, what's going to happen when the temperature gets warmer? What's going to happen when I'm in that place of compromise? What's going to happen when I come to that place of temptation? What's going, if I haven't settled the issue in Caesarea Philippi, what in the world makes me think that I'm going to even have a chance when I get to Jerusalem or to the Jerusalem of my decision? So the first question is, if Jesus asked you right now, what would you say? Here's question number two. If you and I are honest, are the sacrifices we're making today enough? The sacrifices, the things we're investing in, and we're all doing this knowing that the end of this walk in this world is over. Only those things that are done for Christ and and the treasures in heaven will last. If I'm honest, I have to evaluate the sacrifice I'm making. Will they be regurgitated or will they meet with pleasure before my God? Paul the Apostle talks about everything I do is just a bunch of filthy rags and dung. It really comes to nothing because, uh, in all honesty, so much of it's about me, and so much of it is to elevate me, and so much of it is self-satisfying. It's so easy for me to want to be the victim of everything rather than the one who surrenders and offers everything over to Christ. And so my second question, if we're honest, are our sacrifices that we're doing right now enough? And if not, why not? And if they're not, why do I keep investing in those things that keep coming up empty? Only Christ offers us the chance of life. Here's the third and final thing I'd ask you to think about. If things get tougher, and I believe they're going to, will what I'm trusting in get me through the next storm? If things get tougher, and I believe they will, will the things that I'm trusting in get me through the storms that are still before me? Everyone listening knows you are either just coming out of a storm, you're in the middle of a storm, or you're going into a storm. And those storms shape us and refine us to check and see the desire of our heart and to see Is it the temple of Alexander? Is it the temple of Pan? Or is it the temple of goats that's bringing me to try to find something to get me through the storm? See, I I think that's the reason sometimes we get so absorbed with some of the things of this world, Uh, be it a bottle, be it drugs, be it pornography, be it other people, be it self-fulfilling, being an exhausting of this world's sources, uh, you know, we think, man, if I just had enough money, I'd be content. No, we wouldn't. We'd have more money and spend it on more things to be still feeling more empty than we did before we got it. What's preparing you, and I'm asking this of everyone listening, what's preparing you for the storm that's gathering in front of you? And with confidence for me, it's Christ. 
And for me, with confidence, I lean on his word. And Matthew chapter 16 was one of those transformational moments. See, for me, there was confession. For me, there was revelation of truth. And for me, there was empowerment. That's what made it powerful, is as I walked away from there, everything that was after that on that trip for me and for my wife helped me. Sorry, I got my dog in here with me, but everything helped me to realize that Christ and Christ alone was all I needed to satisfy. And I just want to encourage you tonight to look to the author and the finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ, and realize that when you look at the things this world has to offer, if you're able to recognize those things will crumble and come up empty. But he builds his church upon the rock, upon the rock that stands and endures. Uh, one of my favorite stories is told, I believe it was a Scotsman, Irishman, who was one day living through some troublesome days. And a couple of people saw him and noticed that his countenance and his spirit was still really strong. And that it didn't seem the difficulty that he and his fellow uh, people of his country were going through. And they said, how do you do that? Aren't you concerned? Aren't you nervous? And he said something to the effect, I, when I walk barefoot on the rock, my feet they tremble. But the rock under my feet, it never trembles. And that's what I want to encourage you to consider tonight. Wherever you are, whatever you're going, going through right now, Jesus loves you. He has not lost sight of you. He has a plan for you. And it's not one just for this world. It's an eternal plan. And if there was any way that I could encourage you to trust him, and say he is faithful and true. And to me, he's the only message and person that endures through all of this. This is a broken world. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. And I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your Thursday evening and giving me this opportunity to share with you what God is continuing to teach me through this experience of standing in the ruins of Caesarea Philippi and know that though the city crumbles, Christ never fails. Can I just say a prayer for us right now? Maybe mm -hmm. for some of you that are out there going through some tough stuff right now. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't give over. Take heart. Jesus has overcome your world and he loves you with an everlasting love. Let me pray right now. Dear gracious God, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you so much for your presence. Thank you so much for your grace. I pray for each and every person that's listening to this this evening, that you will be able to speak as only you can right into their hearts and know that they are not alone, that you are right there with them, and that they're not listening tonight by accident. They're listening because you've got a purpose for them to hear who you are, and how much you love them, that you would set them in a place tonight to hear your marvelous grace. Thank you that you bring us to those crossroads and challenge us to consider who you are to us. This is not a game. This is a battle of eternal consequences. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood and principalities and powers and things of this world, but you have enabled us to be overcomers. Guide us, I pray, in all that we do and say, and we love you and thank you for loving us. Do what only you can do right now. Jesus, come into our heart. Forgive us of our sins. Become our Lord and Savior, and may we never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Wow, that was awesome. What an awesome message. And I know, uh, you know, I, I know who... Uh, you know, I know who's on and, you know, and who's listening and, you know, and even in myself, uh, the questions you asked and even with, uh, you know, in the middle of a storm or coming out of a storm, I, I think we all fit into that category. Um, if we if we're not, then I think we're in more trouble, you know, because the first thing that hits me is when Jesus says, uh, Father, don't take them out of the world, but protect them in the world. So we know that these storms are going to come. 
But like you said, what is getting you through the storm? And uh, I'll tell yeah. you what, if it's anything outside of Jesus Christ, uh, you're going to hit a monsoon. Yes. Yes. If there's anyone that has any comments, feel free to jump in. Unmute your phone, Mona. Oh, I, I was going to say, I know that he was going to call me. So, yeah, he, um, he, he texted me. He says, this is for you. And I said, yes, yes, it is. Um, I, I appreciate what you brought. It was definitely on time. Um, I am in that storm that I didn't see coming. Um yeah. I, I am a, a God fearing woman of God and uh and uh am in leadership, um both at my church and um I um I'm like Steve, I'm not uh, called a door woman but you know, uh I am the overseer of Trek and Angels for Christ Ministries and it's uh-huh. and uh and it's growing. Uh but uh I got some news a couple of weeks ago that kind of kind of shook me up and um you know and, and i am definitely uh leaning on god's uh direction and guidance and provision um you know in the situation so um i just want to weep because i i know that god is so good and um and i and i know without a shadow of a doubt that he has me where he needs me to be and um and uh I just, I just want to thank you for the word. Bless you. Bless you. I'll be praying for you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I think what a lot of it comes down to is, you know, and I, and I, those that know me, they've heard me say this before. I really believe it, and I stand strong on it. You know, we give our lives to the Lord, but do we allow ourselves to come under his lordship? And in that, uh, depending on him totally for everything. You know, we stop and think, I can't even put my boots on in the morning if it wasn't for him to give me the the strength and the ability to do that, to even climb out of bed. We think about how many people, um, you know, they don't wake up. They didn't wake up this morning. You know, and then the fear comes to you. What did they hear? Did they hear, come in my good and faithful servant? You ran your race? Or did they hear, depart from me? You're due to those iniquity, and I know you're not. You know, God is so merciful, but, you know, we, we need to depend entirely on everything on the Lord. And and through that, you know, our I mean, we just, I don't know how to explain it. You get that assurance, and you know that he's sovereign, and you know that he knew you before you were even created in your mother's womb, and he had a plan for you. You know, I was, um, I, I think it was in Jeremiah I was reading, And he was telling Jeremiah, I knew you before (laughs) you were conceived in your mother's womb. And I called you to be a prophet to all the world. You know, and knowing that he knew each and every one of us before that point, before the creation of the world. How can we how can we even hesitate allowing him to control our lives entirely? And I know that there's times that gets tough. You know, we want to do things our own. You know, I'll do this, I'll do this. Oh, no, I have the Lord do that. I like it where it's just like, you know, Lord, I'm in this jam. Uh, I'm excited to see what you're going to do. And then just sit back and and watch what happens. Amen. Amen. I get excited, but (laughs) when you talk about that zero to ten, yeah, sometimes that can be a scary answer there. You know, I'd like to say 10, you know, but, uh, you know, there again, I- I- if I'm uh, mistaken, you know, please correct me. That's in how much are you going to submit to the Lord? Oh, yeah. Well, I trust him in the trenches. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You know, I like where he says, I want to show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. I get excited. Yeah. What's he going to show me today? (laughs) Lord, what are you going to do? This is good. (laughs) Yes. And I've often thought with things being like they are today, and people saying, oh, I'm so afraid. And it's like, wait a minute, brother, wait a minute, sister. There are generations that have gone 
before us that said, you get to live in this today. You get to demonstrate faith today. As difficult as things are, we're cheering you on. Finish this race and finish it well. And what a great day to live. Uh, If Jesus is coming back this week, man, I want him to come back finding me at the work uh, and, and staying at the task. And for Christians that have gone before us that have laid their lives down, my destiny, your destiny is set. And uh, I should not fear. Uh, don't walk alone. Amen. And I never thought of it that way before. You know, the, those before us went through what they did so that we could be where we're at right now. I like that. You know, and the, 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 I, don't, I don't know if this will come across right, but this is one of the thoughts that I've, I've, I've rolled around in my brain here lately. I, I hear people talking about where we live, and, you know, we had people that, that gave of themselves their whole life, even to the point of death, uh, to be the greatest generation that has ever lived, to bring us to a point of liberty. And we talk about that always in the past. They're not on the stage anymore. You and I are. So it's not what just they did. It's the question of what am I doing? And I think about them in my faith. What Jesus did for me is life and eternity changing. That's wonderful. Don't want to take away from that. But what am I doing today that those who come after me will say, because of their faithfulness, because of what Dwayne did and what Steve did and what others did, my faith is encouraged to go on to the next level should Jesus carry. Uh, so I don't know if that makes sense or not, but I, 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 I'm thankful for that which has come behind, but I am empowered by that which is yet ahead. Amen. Amen. Well, Brother Dwayne, you, you know. You get me excited, buddy. <laughs> That's what it's all about. You get the joy of the Lord, and you get that moving, and, oh, man, you just start thinking about what, you know, what is it to be a child of the living God, you know, the God that created everything. And, you know, like like for each and every one of us, everybody that can hear me, God has a plan specifically for you. Out of all the billions of people that walk the face of this earth, he called Dwayne, I want you to do this. Mona, I want you to do that. Steve, I want you to do this. And put your name in there because God had a plan for you before you were even created. He knew you. And it's just exciting to step out in that plan that he has for you. And you think that I'm not able to do that. I, you know, these other people, they go to colleges. You know, they're more, they're smarter than me. Or, you know, they can do things. I can't do this stuff. Let me tell you. I'm a low-tech redneck with a flip phone. And the Lord took me <laughs> to a place where we're broadcasting to you out of, uh, well, I'm in Michigan tonight <laughs> in the United States for whoever's <laughs> listening. And this is out of the cab of a truck. So tell me that yeah. God can't use you. He can. And you're not, you know, I think about this, Brother Dwayne. Our main goal you know, God said, or Jesus said, go out into the highways and the hedges and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody shared the gospel with me and you and Mona and all these others that are listening that are born again believers. He has called us out to do that. That is our sole purpose of walking the face of this earth. He doesn't need me to drive truck and move steel around the country. That For what? That doesn't glorify or magnify the kingdom of God. It's sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, you know, I, man, I don't know what to say. And what if they ask me a question I don't know? If God called you to do something, he's going to enable you to do that. He's not going to call you to do something where you stand on a street corner looking like a dummy. He's going to enable you. Uh-huh. And, and if you are talking to them about Jesus Christ and they ask you a question and you say, well, I don't, you know, I might not know the answer. Well, we don't all know the answer. And what I say is, you know, that's, that's a good right. question, and I'll try to find the answer. But in the meantime, let me tell you what, what he did for me. And then share your testimony. Okay. You know, it's by the blood of the Lamb in your testimony. Oh, praise God. I'm telling you, you get busy for the Lord. But, you know, Brother Dwayne, a lot of people don't know what we're talking about here. 
So if, wow. if somebody come wow. up to you and talk to you and, 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 and said, uh, Dwayne, hey, you know, you talk about Jesus and you talk about that. You know, I don't know nothing about that. Well, how, how do I find this out? How do I know what you're talking about? What would you tell them? I'd say very simple. It's as simple as ABC. I got to admit where I'm at and see whether that's you or me or anyone to admit where we are at right now is one of the hardest things to do. To be honest with ourselves, to let all the, the layers peel away and just look at the real me and admit that I cannot do this by myself. I can't uh, get through it, can't get out of it, can't get over it, can't get around it. I got to admit where I'm at. And B, I've got to believe in something. And so when I start looking at the things that are out there to believe in. What is it that has substance, that has evidence of its person, its leader, evidence of true transformation, evidence that there is victory in areas that I cannot get victory in. And one of the scariest ones of all is death. What's death mean? What's on the other side of death? So if I'm going to believe in somebody enough that I'm going to put my whole being into them, They've got to answer those questions. And when I look at the scripture, Jesus said that for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When I look at the person of Jesus Christ, not because I'm perfect, but because he is, not because I've got all the answers, but he does, not because I always do the right thing, but he does. And he gave evidence, even to the point of the one I fear the most, which is death. And he beat death, three days dead, rose up from the grave, and he lives still today. I want to believe in somebody like that, and there's only one somebody, and his name is Jesus, the Son of the living God. And then thirdly, not only do I have to admit, not only do I have to believe, but I've got to confess. The Bible says that to confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. I can't just stop there, but I've got to believe in my heart. Where your treasure is, whatever you're trusting in, your heart's going to be there. You don't have to convince your heart to get to your treasure. Your treasure is going to captivate your heart. And I've got to confess by believing with my, confessing with my mouth and believing in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is exactly who he said he was, is, and forever will be, and that one day he is coming back. So it's as simple as ABC. Admit, believe, and confess Jesus is Lord. And if I can add B to that, then I give of myself as his disciple, and I do everything I can to be in his word, to be in prayer, to be with other believers, to be in a state of growing, and like you're talking about, living out that faith everywhere I go. In everything I do, I am his disciple. Doesn't mean I'll get it right every time, but my heart's desire is to be his disciple. So it's A, B, C, and D, and it's got to be personal. Uh, it can't be a group test. It has to be an individual confession. And a person can do that right now, right where they are, and say, well, I've tried Christian stuff. I've tried religion. I've tried all these things. It's not trying. It's surrendering. It's not trying to live. It's learning how to die to self and let the life of Christ radically, personally, intentionally transform my very being in all that I am and all that I do. Amen. And a person can pray and ask Jesus to come into their heart right now. Right That's now. That's right. That's right. That's right. Don't have to go to no fancy building with stained glass windows. Don't have to go talk to right. a priest, a pope, a rabbi, or a deacon. Just talk to the Lord. He already knows Amen. your heart. <laughs> yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, Brother Dwayne, it's been a great evening. You got me all fired up, man. I gotta I gotta try to <laughs> unwind a little bit so I can sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all it's always a pleasure well, Steve, you know the, go ahead it's always a blessing for me yes amen amen well praise the lord that he gives us this opportunity 
because it's all in Jesus Christ and him alone. What does it say? I can do all things through Jesus Christ that strengthens me. Amen. Well, brother, I'd like to pray for you before we close out. That's a rule around here. Please do. Please do. <laughs> okay. Well, Father God, I just thank you for this evening, Lord. And, Father, as your word pierced our hearts, and I pray, Father, that we not just listen to the words, but, Lord God, that we, that we live them, that, Lord, we, we listen to what was said tonight and, and examine our lives and see how this fits in with us as we go forward, and we'll go forward stronger than where we was prior to this. Father, I thank you for my brother. Oh, Lord, what a blessing when the day that you opened the door that I was able to meet my brother. And, and Father, I just thank you that how you show us how big our family tree is and, and what a great uh, 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 togetherness, how we come together in like-mindedness because it's all because of the love mm. of Jesus Christ and the love that we have for you. I pray, Father, that your protection is around my brother and his family, that no hurt or harm or evil or wicked thing will come against them, Lord. Father, your word says that you encamp with angels around about those that love you and are called according to your purpose. But, Father God, I know that, that the enemy can't come into that circle. But, Father, I pray for wisdom that we don't step out of that circle. Father, I pray that you open up doors to my brother that he doesn't even know exist. He, as he sits and thinks, he, he, he can't think of that door because it, it's something that's totally unknown to him. But you said you'll show us great and mighty things that we know if not. And, Father God, you have a plan for my brother. And, Lord, every step that he takes is blessed because he's listening to you. He's moving forward as you tell him. And he turns when you tell him. And I praise you for that, Lord. So, Father, I pray for each and every driver running up and down these highways tonight. I pray, Lord God, your protection to be around them, around their families, their children, their grandchildren. I pray, Father God, if we're going to change their lives, it's not by running them over, but by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the, you know, that's the true way of a, a, of a change of life is that ground zero when they surrender their lives to Jesus Christ and all things become new to them. But, Father God, I pray that uh, in, in all that's going on, Lord, that we stay close to you, that our eyes are upon you and not the storm. So, Lord God, again, bless my brother. And, Lord, because he's such a blessing to each and every one of us. And, Father God, we pray this by only one name, and that is the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. What a blessing, brother. The blessing is all ours. You know, the, the, this ministry belongs to all those that come to listen and those that come to speak. It's not, you know, we know it's the Lord's ministry. Uh, you know, he's in control of everything. But, you know, you, sometimes you hear people say, well, this is my ministry. This is what, <laughs> it's not like that. I mean, without the speakers, there would be nobody to listen. And without the people to listen, there would be no sense in a speaker. So we're all come together in the body of Christ to make this ministry uh, functional as it is. So we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. And with and that. I keep you all in my prayers. Oh, well, we, we definitely appreciate that. So with that being said, good night, everybody. I uh, pray blessings upon you, and I look forward to uh, another Thursday evening when uh, we open that door, and there's always room at the Lord's Round Table. Good night, everybody. We love you. Good night. Good night. This session is no longer being recorded. <laughs>